Father, we are free in Jesus Christ. We cannot be held down. And Father, this morning, as we come to your word, would you just unlock us with the power of your word today, Father? May we be encouraged. May we be those people that have so much hope that the people around us in our worlds ask us the reason for that hope. Why are you hopeful in the midst of what we're going through? And Father, we've been singing about it. It's because of your son, Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Father, speak to us now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I also want to welcome those that are down, just down the hallway. Well, of course, we want to welcome those at home, but we also have a venue this morning in the quad. So if you're in the quad, welcome. You're part of this gathering as well this morning. Well, you know, in Christianity, we have our symbol. It's, it's right back there. It's the cross. And the cross is the symbol of the love of God. He so loved us that he gave his only son that who, who died on the cross for us. But there's another symbol, and it's a symbol that we have been singing about this morning, and it's a symbol that Peter talks about in the book of 1 Peter this morning as well as we come back to our series in Peter. And it's the symbol of the empty tomb. While the cross tells us and reminds us of the great love of God, it's the empty tomb that reminds us of the power of God and the power of God in our lives as well. And it shows us and it reminds us that there is hope because of that empty tomb this morning. And we see it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, I want to read it to you from a paraphrase and because uh, I think it, it contemporizes it a little more. He says this, and this is how important the empty tomb is. If there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications, if there's no resurrection. In fact, if all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, then we're a sure a sorry a lot this morning. And you know, a lot of people think that last line is what defines us. They think that we just gather together to sort of encourage ourselves with this fairy story that we have built up over the last 2,000 years about the death of Christ. But they don't understand the power of the Lord. And when you think about places to find hope, that's where our hope is found. But that's not typically where one would go to find hope, right? A, a tomb, a graveyard... You probably wouldn't think of that, and yet that's exactly where we find hope this morning. We've been singing about it. We're, we're in the Word, and it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the defining event of our faith. And there is hope there for us, for most people anyway. I think there's one exception. I think that empty tomb 2,000 years ago uh, was maybe not quite so hopeful, at least at the beginning, for the author of the book that we're going through, Peter. I don't know that Peter felt a whole lot of hope on that morning. You might remember the account at the Last Supper, how Jesus was telling his disciples what they could expect, what was coming up. And at one point, he let them know that you're all going to fall away. You're all going to desert me. And what did Peter say? Peter said, oh, no, Lord, if everybody else leaves you, if everybody else abandons you, I will never do it, Lord. I will be there to the death. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, on this very night, you will deny me three times. Peter didn't believe it, but of course we know that's exactly what happened. And the last time Peter saw Jesus alive, that was what he had on his mind. I've denied my Lord. I am a total failure. I've denied what I'm all about. And then came the morning. Maybe this morning you would say the same thing. I've, I've struggled in my walk with Christ. I've, I've made commitments. I've, I've even made New Year's resolutions. And already, who knows what those are anymore? I've failed and then that morning, 2,000 years ago, when those women arrive to anoint the body of Jesus, and they meet this angel, and here's what the angel says to them. He says to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. 
He is not here. See, here is the place where they laid him, but go, look at this, tell his disciples, what does it say there? And Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Jesus is personally reaching out to Peter because he knows Peter needs that encouragement. And he's even going to be more direct, as we'll see in a few minutes. And so I ask again this morning, have you failed in your walk with Christ? Have you failed in your relationships around you? Maybe promises you've made that you didn't keep. Maybe this morning as we talk about hope and and, and having hope in the midst of the hopeless, maybe at times you would say, I'm a little more like the hopeless than I am the hopeful today. Well, Peter knows how you feel. And this book is for you. Turn, if you will, to the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to pick it up in verse 3, where we left off last week. I also want to encourage you, the, the notes are available to you on the church app. We have a few hard copies here in the building, if you want some of those. There's also a series of questions that we've written for the life groups this week, so I encourage you to be a part of a life group, or else use those questions uh, in your own uh, devotions as well. For Peter, the empty tomb really wasn't empty, as we're going to see this morning. It was full of grace. It was full of forgiveness. And Peter shares with us three things that he found and that we can find there as well. Like Peter, and as we've been seeing already this morning, the resurrection gives us hope. His introduction last week, Peter introduced himself, introduced who he was writing to, and then he proceeded to tell them, to remind them who they are, who we are in Jesus Christ. And boy, was that encouraging. And now, after that encouragement, after Peter realizing who he is in Christ, he just breaks out in praise. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, the tomb, the empty tomb is the best evidence of the resurrection. And I'm not going to get into the evidences for the resurrection. This is not a, a, an apologetic service this morning. However, it is the best evidence. I mean, you can talk about all the things, you know, whether or not somebody had actually risen from the dead or not, but really you have to explain away in some way the empty tomb, especially when the people at that time went so far to make sure that nobody was going to be able to get that body out of there. Our critics will often say, you know, well, somebody stole it or these people made up the story. And if you do just a little bit of study on that, you find out that is, that is near to impossible. In fact, it is. It's just impossible. He says here that our hope is a living hope. Our hope, Jesus Christ, is alive. That the word that he uses there for living hope means that our hope is sure. It is certain. It is real. As opposed to the hopes that we find in this world, hope that is deceptive, hopes that are empty, hopes that are false. As we move through this world, what we find, what I find anyway, and I'm sure many of you would agree, is that the hopes of this world seem to start fading away, especially as you get older. They they begin to fade away, and the hope that is coming in the next life begins to grow, begins to become more uh, of, of something that I'm anticipating, more that I'm looking forward to. I've heard for many years, uh, as I'm sure you have as well, of how guys would have a midlife crisis. And I used to kind of wonder what that was. Well, then I went through it. I went through midlife. And I found out what it was. What it really is, is that when you're young, you've got all kinds of hope. You know, I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, and, and you try one thing, and if it doesn't work out, well, that's no big deal. I'll just try something else. That's, that's the great thing about being young, right? You can, you can try something. If it doesn't work, just go and do something else. You can always keep hoping about the future. And then you get to that point in your life, about midlife, where you realize everything's not open to me anymore. I'm probably not going to be an astronaut now, unless they're going to take, you know, pastors to the moon or something. It it just probably is not going to happen. And so the things I have to be hopeful for in this world begin to disappear. But guess what? The next world becomes even stronger because every day I'm closer to that world. 
And so I'm encouraging you that, that as things in this world fade, and as particularly as we've been going through this, this pandemic, and we've seen things taken away from us, some of us have lost our jobs, some of us have lost our health, some of us have lost family members. I mean, there's all kinds of things that maybe we'd put hope in and, 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 and received encouragement from that are no longer there. And as those things are disappearing, maybe this is a time for us to really begin thinking about or continue thinking about what is it that I am hoping for beyond this life? I've known many people that can't wait for the next life. We've been praying for Betty Kuiman, and she got her wish this past week. And this morning, she is worshiping at the foot of the throne of God. Can you imagine that? And she was so looking forward to it. I mean, we've been praying that that the Lord would take her quickly so she could be in his presence. Peter describes this living hope in verse 4. Look what he says. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. That phrase there, it is reserved in heaven. heaven. That means it's, it's guarded. It is protected. It's, a, it's like God's got it in his safety deposit box. It is a certainty. Realize that there, he, he's writing to people who have lost everything, many of them. Their families have had funerals for them. You know, if, if, if as a Jew, you became a Christian, you were persona non grata for a lot of the people that were closest to you. Oftentimes, they'd lost their businesses. They couldn't conduct affairs. They couldn't be a part of Jewish society anymore. So he's writing this to them, and he's saying, God, God has something so much better for you. I know these days during this pandemic, there's a lot of people that are, that are uncertain about what does the future hold, what's been taken away. We went through, obviously, a very contentious election. And this past week, we have inaugurated our new president. And on the first day, he, he put into, into place uh, 17 executive orders. And I think he's up to 30 plus executive orders, a huge amount. But we're in unusual days. But everything seems to be changing at a very rapid pace, and people don't know what to do about it. It was the same four years ago for, a lot of times, the other side. People were like, they didn't know how to process this. How do we deal with this? I read that, that one executive order has the potential to, to, for, to cause 11,000 people to lose their jobs. And so we have, we we're living in an environment somewhat like those first century Christians. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to my retirement, my income? Will my, will my inheritance in this world support me? You see, some people I talk to in this world right now are hopeless. They don't know everything that they were counting on. The stuff that they were putting their their faith and their hope in in this world is now fading away. And guys, that's when Christ and the gifts and the things we've been talking about becomes more obvious to them when they see it in us. The empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives me that hope. But not only that, as we see next, this hope then begins to build our faith. Look at verse 5. He says, you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That, that word there, protected, is actually a military term. It's talking about how we are guarded, like by a garrison. What he's saying here is God isn't going to lose you. There have been, there, there's no executive orders that can write God out of the equation. Philippians 1, 6 encourages us with, us with that as well. He says, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus. God is still on the throne. And even if I fall away, he is still there. Even if I deny him three times, <laughs> he is still there. My kids and I used to play a game when they were little. It was, uh, I don't know if we ever really called it anything, but it was, if, if I were to name it, I would call it Catch Me Daddy. And what they would do is they would jump at me and I would catch them. Now, when my kids would do that, of course, they would also grab me. I would grab them, they would grab me. Usually they got me around the neck. It was like, ah, 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 you know, like that. And the thing is, my kids probably thought that they were, were, were jumping and grabbing me. But the fact was, I had them. They didn't have to grab me. And sometimes they didn't really grab me all that well, but they were still safe because I had them. 
And you know, sometimes I think that, that uh, if, I, if, if I catch God, if I hold on to him, then I'm going to be okay. We think we're holding on to God, but the fact is, guys, God is holding on to us. As Peter reminds us here, we are protected in him. We are protected uh, uh, by the power of God through our faith. And you know what he says? In the last day, you're going to realize that. You're going to realize that in the last day that God was there all the time. We're going to see that, you know what? I, I was so worried. I was so, I was so caught up in, 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 the, uh, in the flurry of people upset and concerned that I, that I didn't realize what God was doing. And in the last day, we're going to see, oh, he was there all the time. I, I read this week about a college fraternity that was doing this... Uh, this activity to sort of jump people into the, to the fraternity, I guess it was. And what they did was they took this guy and they took him to an old abandoned well. And they had this rope with a knot tied on the end. And they said, if you want to be in the fraternity, you've got to do what we say. So grab the rope at the end of the knot and we're going to lower you down into this, into this well and you hold on until we pull you out. And so they lowered him down there, and he's down there hanging from this knot at the bottom of the well. And it's pitch black, and he's hanging. He's doing okay for a while, but obviously his arms are starting to, starting to fail him, and, he's, and it's really burning. And after a while, he starts calling up, and the guys are like, no, no, you hold on. And, and, he's, and he doesn't know what he's going to do. He's like, I'm going I'm to break my leg. Who knows you know, what's going to happen when I fall into this well? And it gets worse and worse and worse, and finally, he just can't hold on anymore, and he lets go. And he falls about three inches to the floor of the well. <laughs> and the guys knew what they were doing. They knew when they were letting him down that that was going to be the case. And guys, sometimes that's the way we are in life. I get so worried. I get so concerned. I've got to hold on. I've got to make sure that, that I am secure in this. And God says, don't worry about that. I've got you covered. I've got you covered. I, I'm caring for you. And, and when I get to that point where I just can't hold on anymore, your hope in God will give you the faith at times maybe to just let go of that rope. I'm just going to let go of this thing that I think is holding me up. And that's when you're going to find out that God is is there for you. He had you covered. Had trust in God. Have faith in him. And that makes us happy. Look at verse 6. He says, in this, the fact that God has got you protected, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Things are tough for them. Things are tough. As I said, their, their families had often abandoned them. If, if it hadn't happened already, they were soon be, to uh, begin experiencing tremendous persecution under Emperor Nero, who was literally going to be executing them for their faith. But guys, we now have a faith in God that says that, that even though these trials are happening in our lives as well, God has a purpose for them. There's a, there's a reason for those trials. Good is going to come out of them. Of course, we know what James says in James chapter 1, uh, verse 2, when he says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter these various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Or how about 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 17, where he says, For our momentary light affliction. Now you say, wait a minute, Willie, I, I'm not going through momentary light affliction. This has been a while now, and it's heavy, and it hurts. Well, he's talking about in relationship to eternity, okay? There's going to be a point, I think, where we look back and we think, man, I thought it was so bad, but, but God was with me, and he wasn't going to let me endure more than I could handle. So he says, for our momentary light affliction, it is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal." Now, I know you may think it might sound like Peter is minimizing the pain. Trials and suffering, they hurt. They, they, are, they, they are huge in our lives, but he's not minimizing it. In fact, when you look back up at verse 6, when he talks about they have been distressed by various trials, that word distressed there is the same word that is used of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was so distressed that he was literally uh, sweating drops of blood. 
And so he's not minimizing it at all. He's realizing you guys have got it extremely difficult. And so, you know, as we go through life, we want it to be easy. When I was, when we were uh, serving with a missions organization, they had their headquarters in Minneapolis. And uh, so there would be a couple times of the year, we would fly back to Minneapolis for various meetings or conferences or, or things like that. And I can remember one flight we had from Minneapolis to LAX, and it was a horrendous flight. I don't know if you've ever been on a flight that's basically a roller coaster ride the whole way. I mean, it was like up and down and sideways and this, and it was like the plane was going to shake apart. And, you know, it was just, it was horrible. People are getting, I've never, I've, I've never ever seen anybody use an air sickness bag, and on that plane, it was all over the place. I mean, it was just, it was, it was a horrible flight. And flights like that make me think, you know, I, I really want to be on one that's, that's easy. It, it's, it's like going to the airport and the person says to you, you know, uh, you, you ask, what's the flight going to be like? And they say, oh, well, uh, it, it's going to be really rough. You know, there's a storm and we're not sure if we can get above it or below it. So it's going to probably be a rough flight. But don't worry, because at the end, you know, we're going to land and you're going to get there. It's going to be rough, but it's going to be safe. And I can imagine myself thinking, after, particularly after experiencing one of those flights, uh, of saying to myself, you know what, I want to shop around a little bit then. I want to find out, is there a better flight? So I go over to another ticket counter and I say, you know, you got a flight to LAX, uh, you know, what, what's the conditions? And they say, you know what, we have planes that make it possible to guarantee you that it's going to be a smooth flight. You know, our planes get up above the weather, and it's going to be a nice, smooth flight. There's just one thing, though, that you want to factor into the mix. I think, what's, what's that? He says, well, we've been having a little bit of trouble with our landing gear. Sometimes it doesn't always come down. And so, you know, when you get to LAX, the plane might crash. You know, it's about a 50-50. What do you think I'm going to go for? Yeah, I'm going to endure the rough. And I say that, I share that because if you think about life that way, I want to go through, don't we really kind of want to go through a stress-free life? I don't want trials. I don't want controversies. I don't want bumps in my life. I want smooth sailing. The problem is the, the people that, that escape the, the trials and the pressures that have that smooth sailing often find out there's going to be a huge crash at the end. And so as we are dealing with those struggles in life, as we have our hope and faith in God, we know that in faith, in the end, we are going to make that safe landing, no matter how bumpy, no matter how rough that flight has been. And we know as well that even those bumps, even that, that turbulence that happens in our life, God has a purpose for that. He is doing something in our lives even through that. That's what Peter is emphasizing to these persecuted believers who are going through horrendous experiences. He doesn't want them to be so concerned with what's happening to them now. Instead, he says, in faith, set your eyes on the big picture. Look forward to what is coming. Rest in the hope that you have and the faith that develops from that. We get so concerned about things in this life. People are concerned, as I say, about the election, that, that, that major shift that's coming. And again, it's, it's happened in the last two election cycles that we've had. But guys, catch this. God is in control. Amen. He was in control four years ago. He's in control now. In fact, I'd even go further because I know... I can't tell you how many times people, I, I hear people say things like, man, I can't wait for 2020 to be over. I can't wait for, you know, I want to just blot it out of the books. I want it out of my memory banks. I want you to know something. I have come to the conclusion, largely through what I've been studying this week, that 2020 was a great year. You know why? Because God was in control, and he still is, and God is doing something. I don't know fully what it is, but I know he's doing something because his word tells me that, and I know that I want to be right in the center of what he's doing. I just know, even right now, I know of people that I've been able to impact that I don't know had I would have been able to had we not had the turbulence that we had this past year. I can only imagine, but I know, based on what we've seen in his word even today, that when I get to heaven, I think I'm going to be amazed at the amazing things he did in the year 2020 through me, through you, through our church, through his church. God is allowing us in his wisdom to be refined. Look at this in verse 7. He says, 
The proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's talking here about refining gold. He's using that as his, as his metaphor. And when you refine gold, you heat it up to, you know, thousands of degrees and it burns off the dross. It burns off all of the impurities. And what's left is pure gold. And that's what God is doing in our lives. He's, he's allowing us in his wisdom to be refined in his furnace in order to develop our character. Romans 3, uh, Romans 5 says it, and no, not only this, but we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, of all things, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And guys, this faith is more precious than gold. Think about it. That's what he says here. It's more precious than gold. It's, it's, uh, I, I remember hearing a story one time about a guy saying that uh, you know, he figured out a way to take money to heaven with him. You know, the, the, most people have to worry about keeping it here. His, his method of taking money to heaven with him was to convert everything he had into gold bars. And then he put the gold bars in a suitcase. And when he died, he, he managed somehow to get that suitcase and go to heaven with it. And when he gets to heaven, he walks up to the pearly gates and uh, Peter says, welcome, you know, enter into the joy of your Lord. By the way, what do you got in the suitcase there? And the guy opens it up and shows him all these glistening gold bars. And Peter says, oh, you've brought some paving stones. <laughs> because that's what gold is in heaven. They, they, they line the streets with gold, okay? It's not all that valuable in heaven. But guys, faith is valuable in heaven. It's the most value because without it, we don't please God. He says here that at the revelation of Jesus Christ, we will praise God for our trials. Why? Because we'll see the results. We'll see the results of what's happening. We get little tastes of that now. If you keep a journal, you probably know what I'm talking about. Hopefully, if you keep a journal, you can, you can go back and read where you were, say, six months ago and say, man, I've grown in that. I've shared with some of you how uh, a friend of mine and I are, are, are exercising every morning down here at 5 a.m. By the way, I'll put in a little plug. If you want to come down uh, Monday through Friday at 5 a.m. and exercise with us, feel free to do that. We're, we're not exclusive. And so, uh, but, but one of the things that was really vexing me was burpees. If you know exercising and burpees, you get on the ground, you do a push-up and jump back up. I could not do the amount they were telling us to do. Well, this past week, I did it. I did it. I I did all the burpees. And that's encouraging because I am seeing, uh, I'm seeing progress. And that's what Peter is getting at here. We will see the results once we get to heaven, but you can get little tastes of it even here on earth. You see, often when we go through difficult times, or maybe, maybe you're in a difficult time right now, and you say to yourself, I don't see how this could be good. I don't see how the death of my loved one can be a good thing. I don't see how the loss of my business or my income or the fact that I'm getting a, 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 you know, an eviction notice for my house, I don't see how that's going to be a good thing. What does Romans 8.28 say? Does it say, uh, we see that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to their purpose? No, it doesn't say that. Instead, it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, we may not see things working together for good, but we've never been promised to see it. I may not see any changes in the next day or month or week or year, or maybe even my life. The Bible doesn't say that we will see it. It says we will know it. It is our certain hope, it is, uh, it, it, and which builds our faith. And faith is not seeing, it is knowing. And that's what Peter continually brings them back to, to remind them of here today. Don't put your faith in what you see, put your faith in what you know. And what do you know? God loves you. And he wants only your best. And he's going to continue to work in your life no matter what's happened. And that didn't change in 2020 because of a little virus. 
God still loves you. He's still working. He's still conforming you more and more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. The resurrection gives us hope, a living hope, as we've been singing. It builds, that that hope then builds our faith. And finally, this faith fuels our joy. Look at verse 8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you don't see him now, but believe in him, that's faith, okay? Look at the results. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. You see, our faith, the issue of faith is what's your faith in? Our faith, our, our, our joy is not in a concept or a creed. Our faith is in a person. It's in Jesus Christ. And that produces this genuine joy. The people Peter was writing to, they hadn't seen Jesus. They hadn't seen him alive uh, and in the same way, we haven't seen Jesus alive. But Peter, he saw Jesus. And what did he do? He failed. And after his resurrection, Jesus meets Peter on the banks of the sea. And he says to Peter, Simon, do you love me? And three times he asked him. You know why he asked him three times, right? Because Peter denied him three times. And each time Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. And ultimately, what does Jesus say? Peter, I'm going to let you feed my sheep. What do we have here? This is, a, this is a, a secret of the Christian life. And it's this, when we truly love Jesus, everything else falls into place. I can boil it down to that. When I truly love Jesus, he's going to let me feed his sheep. This morning, are you really in love with Jesus? Or maybe you're just going through the motions. You just, you just got here. You're just doing the things you need to do. Maybe you're just following the rules. Guys, the world can certainly beat us down. The political situation we're in, race relations, pandemics, family issues, my work or lack thereof, my finances, the list could go on and on and on of the things that are beating us down. And guys, I'm here to tell you, and so is Peter Instead of focusing on those things, I mean, you got to deal with them, of course, but instead of focusing almost nonstop on those things, focus instead on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, on that empty tomb, and I defy you to not get hope out of that, and allow that hope then to build your faith, and let that faith then fuel your joy, and we can do this, guys, because of what verse 9 says. You're obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. That word obtaining is an interesting word. It's a present tense word, and it's a present tense activity, meaning it's something that is happening to you right now. You are obtaining this, the salvation of your souls. We are in the process of getting everything God has for us, even through 2020, this bumpy flight known as 2020. And the present tense, it, it, this, this present tense activity of salvation involves our past acceptance of Jesus Christ. It involves what every, all the things that I, that I possess today. And it also involves everything I'm going to receive when I am ultimately glorified in the presence of the Lord. In spite of what you see, in spite of what you've experienced, guys, it is only going to get better. Amen. Because we have, as we have been singing, a living hope. The worship team's going to come back up and let's sing some more. And I want to leave us with a couple of takeaways. Again, takeaways are the things that, as I go through a passage, I like to personalize it. So these are some things I've taken away. You can uh, decide for yourself whether, uh, you know, what, what God speaks to you about it. But here's my first takeaway, and it's this. I ask myself, honestly, Willie, where is my hope today? Is my hope really in the Lord or is my hope in who is occupying the White House? Is my hope in uh, my, my finances, my bank account, my job situation, my friends, my kids, whatever it is, where is my hope really today? Second question, second takeaway, do I trust what I see or do I trust what I know? Because trust me, guys, if you're trusting in what you see, it's only going to be discouraging. 
it's not going to be hopeful because there's not a lot of hopeful things to see around us these days. No, we have to trust what we know, which then gets us back into the word because the more I know, the more hope there's going to be, the more faith is going to be built because of what I know God says is true. And then number three, this is one that I ask myself, do others consider me a joyful person? As I am out in my world, am I, am I carrying, am I conducting myself in such a way that people are asking that question? What is the reason for your hope? Do they see the hope in me? Is the joy something that is working on me on the inside so much that it's obvious even on the outside? I want to finish this morning by sharing with you that I have put this into practice specifically this week. I've gone through a, a tough few weeks I've had some issues in my life that I have been dealing with and struggling with, and it's impacted the relationships around me, the people that I am closest to, because when I let these things fester on me, the things that we've been talking about this morning, really focusing on this world, when I, when I let those things work on me, it changes me, it changes my demeanor, it changes the way I relate to the people around me, and fortunately, I have people around me that are honest enough with me to, to, to call me on the carpet and say, what's going on with you? What's happening with you? And so that, that caused me to kind of pull up short and say, okay, Lord, what am I doing? And as I studied this, I really... <laughs> You know, surprise, surprise, I put it into practice. I, fo- I began focusing on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah, this is going on. Yeah, I feel this way. Yeah, I think I've been treated like this. But guess what? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he did it for me. And because of that, I have a hope in a resurrection. And that hope then began to build my faith. And I began to realize that no matter what else is happening, I trust what God says is true of my life. And that faith is fueling my joy, not only this morning, but even beyond. Has my struggle changed? (laughs) Has everything cleared up? No, it's still there. And the struggle that the, that the people that Peter was writing to in Asia Minor, it hadn't changed. And the struggle hasn't changed for the persecuted church around the world this morning. They're still in the trouble, in the struggle, but I am joyful and they are joyful even in the midst of the trials and frustrations. And because of that, I am always ready, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, I am always ready to make a defense to everyone who asks me to give them account of the hope that is in me with gentleness and respect. And that's what we've been called to do as we pray for those people on our cards, as we go to our worlds, as they see the difference in us and want what we have. That's the purposes, that's some of the purposes behind what we're going through and why. I hope that's encouraging to you. I know it's been to me, and I hope you got a little bit of the, uh, the cast off from what I've been through this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you again, Lord, for your word. You are our living hope. It's a hope that is alive and effective and active right now, right this moment, right in our environment. And Lord, especially, it's, it's one thing to remember it as we're here in church surrounded by our brothers and sisters in Christ. When, when, when all the environment is focused on uh, encouraging and building up and strengthening. But Father, throughout this week, when we get out there alone, when we get into those places where uh, maybe we are the only Christian in that environment, Father, that's the point at which I want you to remind me. I want to be uh, energized and fueled by the hope and the faith and the joy. So much so, Lord, that the people around me see that difference and want it for themselves. Lord, give us opportunities this week to share with the people in our worlds this great hope, faith, and joy that you've given to us. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.